Welcome to IT Automation with Puppet. Uh, my name is Romain Tartier. I live in France. I've been a FreeBSD user for quite some time, a FreeBSD contributor about 10 years ago. By that time, I was a systems administrator for the association, which was called Health Grid, which was involved in the European grid infrastructure. Uh, I was a grid site administrator, so at that time, I started to wonder how can I manage many computer nodes which have basically the same configuration in an efficient way. And at that time, that was that um, new tool called Puppet. I don't know exactly when I started to use Puppet, but I was there when, 10 years ago, they decided to name the version following 0.25, 2.6, and change the position of the dot in the version number. Today, we are going to um, have a two-part talk. The first one will be a general introduction to Puppet, and the second one is on specific topics uh, with a learning curve, which represents basically uh, when I have a customer who tell me, okay, I want to automate things in my infrastructure, uh, I have no knowledge and I want to automate things, it's the way I, told, I tell them to proceed. So, because I have quite a long presentation and I would like to avoid uh, wasting too much time, may we quickly do a poll. If you have already used Puppet, if you have written manifests, written modules, and you have a good overview of how things work, please raise your hand. Okay, not much people. And at the opposite, if you have never used Puppet and you do not know exactly how it works, please raise your hand. Much more people. So I will try to not be too fast on the first part so that you are not lost. And for those who use Puppet, well, it will be quite a bit boring, I'm sorry. And on the second part, uh, I hope that you will be allowed to follow. At any moment, if you feel that uh, something is not clear, please raise your hand and stop me so that I can clarify. That way, we will not do uh, questions at the end of the presentation, uh, because this is usually a bit boring, because we lose context, etc. So as soon as something is not clear, raise your hand and I will try to uh, make it clear for you. So let's start by asking us, why would you use Puppet? We use Puppet for automation, but what do you want to automate? Generally, you want to automate for consistency, for predictability, for reliability, and for speed. Not necessarily in that order, because this is alphabetical order, uh, but the idea is that if you have configured four nodes the same way, you expect them to do the same job. And if you have a fifth node and you configure it exactly the same way, you expect it to behave like the others. And if there is a problem with one node, you expect the problem to be on all your nodes. And because computers are already good to do things fast, compared to doing things manually, uh, your fifth computer will be configured way faster than if you did it by hand. So let's see how Puppet works. Basically, in your infrastructure, you have two kinds of nodes. You have Puppet agents installed on all your nodes, and you have a Puppet master. Every half an hour, by default, a Puppet agent will collect facts. That is, for example, its name, its IP addresses, it's uh, the quantity of RAM it has, etc. And it will send this to the Puppet Master. The Puppet Master will use these facts and a configuration file called the manifest. And it will build uh, the configuration, the expected configuration of that node, which is called a catalog. And this catalog will be sent back to the agent. The agent will apply this catalog, that is, it will check if its state matches what is the expected state and it will correct things if there are problems. And after this, the Puppet agent will send back a report to the Puppet master. For example, oh, I was supposed to have the Apache service running, it was stopped, so I started it. The only thing that the systems administrator will have to manage is the manifest. So what is in this manifest? A manifest is written in a Puppet language. It declares resources. Here is a resource. It's a user resource for managing a user account for me, Roman. 
Uh, and we ensure that this user account is present, that is, that the user exists on the system. Uh, we set the Gecko's field to my full name and my shell to ZSH. Of course, the user type can manage more uh, parameters. I have set only three. I might have managed my password here. I would have put the hash of my password, and then it would, be, it would have been enforced and changed it if it was not the right hash. Here it is not present, so Puppet will just not handle it. It will leave it as is. This configuration is completely static, but we can do things more dynamic and use variables because we are using a language, the Puppet language. Here we have our file resource, which manages the etc MOTD file, and the content of that file is set to a variable MOTD, which is defined on the top of the slide. And, well, this is a weird here doc syntax, but you can see that the MOTD content is two lines of text. This is the fact networking FQDN, which you guess is the fully qualified domain name of the node uh, that is um, for which we are building that catalog. And running the fact OS family and fact OS architecture, which are two other facts. Remember, the agent sends its facts to the puppet master at the start of the communication. So what do these facts look like? Basically, uh, these are key values. So for example, if we have the OS, uh, the OS fact, which has architecture and, and family, which were used uh, here to uh, replace uh, the content. So while this uh, snippet of code will be the same for many nodes, each node will have a different MOTD file. But we can do better than that, of course. We can, have, uh, we can use functions and conditionals to conditionally include parts of a uh, manifest. For example, managing a service only if certain condition is met. Uh, we can have arrays to uh, uh, factorize code in order to avoid repeating ourselves. And we have also a concept of classes. Often, when you want to manage a service, uh, you want to install a package, and then you want to change configuration files. And we have done this, you want to uh, start the service. And you do always want to do the three. Here I have a simpler example, because of uh, the size of the slides, where I just have a service and a package that I want to manage. And the last line here indicates that I want the package foo to be managed before managing the service foo, because maybe uh, the service is installed by the package. When I declare a class, it's not added to the catalog. I have to either use include, require, or contain, which are basically the same things. They just add relationships with the thing that do the include, require, or contain. Or we can use a resource style declaration, which we'll speak about later with class foo, just as we use user Roman. The Puppet language also has concept of defined classes, which allows us to basically create custom types, types in the Puppet language. For example, here, I define a root file, special type, defined class, that accepts a file name, but not the full file name, just the part, uh, the file name of the file name will be created at the root of the file system with the content uh, specified. So far, all this configuration uh, is applied to all our nodes, but usually you have different nodes that are supposed to do different things and you don't want them to do the same thing. So we don't want to rely on conditionals to do it. We can use a node statement, which allows us to match a matching fully qualified domain name or host name or we can use regex to match some hosts, and we can also have a default node for nodes which are not yet classified. This is basically what Puppet provides out of the box. As you can guess, many people want to do similar things. Here comes modules. Modules provide an abstraction. I said that you can create a class that contains, for example, the service configuration and package for something, and in order to redistribute this, you can use modules. So, uh, for example, you have Apache modules, PostgreSQL modules, etc. 
And a neat point of these modules is that they abstract the uh, specific details of the operating system. For example, if you configure Apache Web Server on Debian, it will name, this package will be named Apache 2. On CentOS, it might be HTTPD. On FreeBSD, it will be HTTP 2.4. So these details are abstracted by the modules. You don't have to care about this. Where do you find these modules? Well, Puppet Labs has a Puppet Forge. Uh, it's a central repository for modules with uh, more than 5,000 modules available. There is sometimes some uh, redundancy because it seems that more than 400 different people wanted an SSH module and created it. So maybe it's not worth to have so many modules to manage SSH. But, well, SSH is quite the worst example. There are many uh, interesting uh, projects which have uh, far less modules, but you still have, for example, if you search for Apache, you will find dozens of modules to manage Apache. So don't roll your own module, because basically modules should be as abstract as possible. Um, if you, in the case, uh, or if you don't find what you are looking for in the Puppet Forge, it's worth checking the rest of the internet, because some authors do not publish uh, their modules on the Puppet Forge. This was a quick introduction. Is it okay for everyone? Okay, let's see now how I proceed when a customer wants to have puppets uh, on his site. Well, the first step, of course, is to install puppets. On FreeBSD, we have the Puppet 5, uh, CCTL's Puppet 5 uh, port, which uh, installs Puppet 5. I've not mentioned the versions here, but uh, if you are new to Puppet, please don't consider anything else than Puppet 5. Um, Puppet has a Puppet command line tool, Puppet, which can manage things, because Puppet manages things, and you can use it to enable Puppet and start the service regarding, regardless of the operating system it's installed on. So, for example, if you are running a Red Hat system or Debian system, you will not use uh, the FreeBSD Puppet 5 port, uh, but Puppet Labs provide uh, RPM and uh, Debian packages repositories, so you can get the packages there. And this command line will work regardless of the operating system you're using. So why not use it? Then you will need to install a Puppet Master. It's basically the same. We have a Puppet Server 5 uh, port in the ports tree. Um, it seems that we have to adjust the Puppet Server login class in rc.conf in some circumstances, at least. At home, it does not work if I don't do it, but maybe it's because I don't have much RAM, and Puppet Server is a closure program, so it needs a GVM, GVM, etc. Quite consuming a lot of RAM. When we have done this, we can start hacking. So to discover uh, the Puppet language and to play with modules, the the easiest step is to just create a, a directory, user local etc puppet environments production manifest. You may be wondering, whoa, and you are quite right. But we will see after that it makes some sense. So at the beginning, just put uh, pp files into that directory. For example, you can put a site, the pp file, where you put your, um, your resources and you test. And when you you should be very quickly uh, confident with what you write. So a good point is uh, determining what to start with. Often, people want to start to do automation with automating uh, deployment of Puppet itself, which is the worst idea you can have. Start with something you master. Start with something that is uh, true for all your nodes. You probably have SSH on all your nodes. Maybe it's a good point to automate SSH configuration, or NTP configuration, or monitoring configuration, and so on. And as soon as you feel like you copy and past things, something is not very good, you should stop. Because this step is only to discover the Puppet language. At this point, when you, co you, when you start to copy and past code, you will want to use what we call a control repo. So, manifests or code. As we have said, it uses a Puppet language. It's a language, it's code. And when you use code, you generally use a VCS. And I say generally, but you should use a VCS. You should, you should use a VCS. 
So, manifest shall be managed in a version control system. But instead of starting with an empty git directory, repository, sorry, uh, the best way is to use the, the template provided by Puppet Labs, which is called Control Repo. It's a particular git repository. First, it has a lot of content with examples, so it will give you inspiration. And also, you will notice that it does not have a master branch, but rather a production branch. Remember here, we saw that we had some special directory and we had a production member in that directory. In fact, the idea of the control repo is that each branch will be extracted into the environment's uh, directory. And to do this, you will use a tool named RTNK, which is also available as a port uh, in the FreeDSD port tree, which will extract the branches of the control repository to the right directories. That way, when you are hacking on your manifests, you can check out the production branch, create a feature branch, put your changes in this feature branch, push your commits into the control repo, and if you have a post receive hook, it will be deployed automatically, and then you will be able, on some nodes, to try your changes without affecting the other nodes. This will allow you to test your changes very easily and very effectively. Once you have your control repo, so you have moved your files that were not under version system in the, in the manifest directory into the manifest directory of the control repo, uh, you will notice that the control repo also has a site directory. And this directory allows you to do something that is quite a big part of what people are using uh, with Puppet, which is called the roles and profile pattern. So let's sum up. We have uh, resources provided by Puppet, such as packages, files, users, groups, etc. Above this, we add a layer of abstraction with modules, which allows us to manage, for example, Apache, Bakula, PostgreSQL, etc. The role and profile pattern adds two more abstraction layers. The profile are on top of the modules and will have all your site-specific configuration. For example, you have web servers, you have mail servers, and these will be configured using the modules, but they will abstract this and they will provide a simpler interface. And above this, you have the roles. Basically, the idea is that when you have a computer, yeah, you give it a role. Oh, this is uh, the machine that has the web server. And this is the machine that does, does something. This is a build server with Jenkins. This is, etc. So the idea is that you know will be using a single role. A role will be composed of many profiles. And the profiles will use various modules and resources. So, to configure our nodes, we will still be uh, managing this in the manifest directory of the control repository. We will have node, and for each node, a single include of a specific role. For example, here I have two nodes. One will be a website, and one will be for the product. They are classified with a, a role website and role product. The role node are um, placed into the site role manifests directory and are named after the role name. So for example, the base role is named site role manifest base.pp and they include profiles. So the website profile, because it inherits the base role, will include four different profiles. The website role here will include web server profile, example com website, profile, OpenSSH profile, and syslog profile. And the same applies for the product role. Profiles, just like roles, are stored into the site profile manifest directory, named after the profile name, so the web server profile will be named site profile manifest web server.pp. And then we will use a resource style declaration for the different resources we use. So here we use the Apache, um, an Apache module and we configure it. For example, in this, in, on this site, 
we want Apache to be configured to not serve a default vhost, to not uh, have the default modules, to use the event NPM, uh, to not use the default uh, server tokens that says it's Apache version, etc. We want to just to say it's Apache. And we want to configure the mod SSL module to only allow TLS 1.2 or better, because it, it is our site requirements. And by using this profile, we are sure that if a profile has a, a node as a web server profile, the website profile, no, the web server profile, sorry, it will be configured according to our site needs. A few words about include versus resource style declaration. Okay? You can either include Apache or use class Apache with parameters. What is the difference between the two? Well, it's quite obvious that when you use class Apache, you can put parameters so you can change the defaults, which you can't do when you include Apache. Well, in fact, we will see after that that there is a component in Puppet called Hira that allows us to specify parameters which are not explicitly set in the manifest. But there is another point which is important with include versus resource style declaration. When your manifest has two times an include Apache, what does Puppet do? The include function basically tells Puppet, okay, here is a class name. If this class is not in the catalog, add it. Otherwise, do nothing. So the first time, it will see include Apache. And Apache is not in the catalog, so it will add Apache in the catalog. And the second time, it will see include Apache. But it is already in the catalog, so it will do nothing. On the other hand, if you do resource style declaration, you tell Puppet, OK, add the Apache class with npm module event and server tokens prod into the catalog. And it will do it. And then you tell it, OK, add the Apache class with npm module equal prefork and server tokens to fall into the catalog. And of course, it will fail, because you can't configure two resources of the same type with the same name. It does not make sense. You can't configure Apache and use as a default npm uh, event and prefork. You have to choose one or the other. Even if you use exactly the same parameters, Puppet will not allow you to use two times the same resource. So, in our, oops, sorry, in our role and profile pattern, what we have to remember is that on each node, we will include one role. And in each role, we will include as many profiles as we need. And in our profiles, we will never include. Well, we might never include. I recommend to always use resource style declaration in your profiles. That way, if for some reason, you have a profile that uh, uses resource style declaration for a component, and for some reason, somebody one day uh, commits another profile that configures the same thing. And if one day it happens that the two profiles are used on the same node, it will blow out. And it's a good thing because you have a conflict. You should not configure the same thing at two different places. It's probably a very bad idea. So it's a recommendation to always use resource style declaration in your profiles and otherwise always include things at a low configuration, just as we will see right now. Here is another example where we configure a mail server. Well, when I configure a mail server for my infrastructures, generally all nodes are able to communicate with everybody. Basic mail, user at hostname, finished. But I do manage some computers which are behind a firewall or a net uh, under uh, the network of a customer I don't really trust and I, or, or where I can't directly deliver mails. So I have some mail servers that act as a normal and real way mail servers, and I have some mail servers which are quite weird. I might have created two different profiles to manage this. So normal web mail server and untrusted mail server, for example, uh, so that the untrusted mail server does not accept uh, incoming mail and send all the mails through a relay host. But rather than doing this, which has a main drawback, uh, which has quite big drawback. The big drawback with this is that if I have a, 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 a role 
for configuring, for example, my uh, service website. And the service website, which will be deployed on many nodes, uh, needs to send mail. If I have <coughs> nodes that need one mail profile and other nodes that need another mail profile, that means that I will mean, need two roles, two different roles to configure the same stack just having a different, slightly different mail configuration, which is, which is quite bad. Instead of this, I can have a single role that says, oh, I need a mail server. And in my configuration for that precise node, say, oh, the mail server on this node should have a slightly different configuration than usual because the node itself is not so connected directly to the internet, for example. So here, in my profile mail server, I added um, a parameter, a configuration parameter. I lost my mouse. Okay, I my, never mind. Oh, it's here. Okay, a configuration parameter that allows me to change some settings. So this is a very uh, smart snippet of my real configuration. So I only focus on the listen address here. If the configuration is set to smart host, which is the default, the postfix package will listen on all IP addresses. But if I change the configuration and set it to relay host, I will only listen on the loopback addresses. Likely, I will change all the configuration to use, for example, uh, the Puppet certificates to communicate with the relay to relay mail through there. The idea here is that my two different mail server configurations only differ by a single setting, which say configuration smart host or configuration relay host. If you have done some object-oriented programming, you may probably know the GoF, and you probably are aware of the facade and adapter patterns. It's basically what we are doing. We have <coughs> a bunch of modules that we want to configure, and they have very complex uh, interfaces because they allow us to configure all aspects of a mail server, all aspects of a website, all the aspects of everything. And you want a simple interface, that is, my website profile has no parameters. All my website are configured the same way. I provide a very simple abstraction of this complexity. And also, my mail server has a single parameter to configure and to choose from for my colleagues. If they want to set up a new node, they don't have to go through the postfix uh, configuration to know what settings they want to use. They will use a profile and say, see that there is only one setting, and they will say, oh, oh, this node is not able to send mail directly. I will configure it that way. So to sum up the role and profiles pattern, we have nodes that will include a single role. We have roles which are named after the, the role of the machine. This is a website of the company. This is the production uh, stuff, this is, etc. cetera. Uh, and this role will include any number of profiles, and, all the, and the profile will configure the actual resources. And they will be named after the technology stack they configure. Now, how do I say that this node needs to be configured as a relay host? It defaults to a smart host, but I added a configuration to be able to change a configuration for some nodes. Here come HERA. HERA uh, stands for hierarchy. You have a, a YAML file as a root of the control repository, which is named hierarchy.yaml, that allows you to configure a um, set of layers where Puppet will look for settings to override uh, parameters that have no explicit values. Instead of using the default value of the module, before using the default value of the module, if you have not set an explicit value in your manifest, here I will be able to catch a value and to use it. Let's take our example of mail server. Um, we have set up here a hierarchy of three levels. <coughs> On the top, we have uh, node-specific configuration. Each uh, node will be able to have its specific configuration. And we also have data center specific configuration. So here we have alpha, beta, and gamma, which are in the same data center, and delta is an, in another data center. And we have a common uh, YAML file for everyone. 
let's say that uh, I want the gamma machine to act as a relay host. I just have to create a node slash gamma.yml file and put this gamma snippet here to configure it as a relay host. Quite simple. But if it's not just gamma, but all the DC1 data center that needs to be configured that way, because I don't know this data center has shitty IP address and uh, we are flagged as spam each time we send mail from there, we can just drop a file into the DC slash DC1.yml file. And only the nodes which are in the DC1, which have the DC1 fact uh, as a data center will receive this configuration. As you might guess, the host name is a fact that is known by all uh, Puppet uh, servers. In fact, uh, Factor, which collects facts, collects a large amount of facts uh, by default, including the host name. But as you can imagine, it has no way to know which data center your computer is in. And in order for this to work, you have to add some facts into Factor. Let's see how you do that. Facts will allow you to, uh, will help when classifying uh, nodes. So for example, if a building has a room uh, with different numbers on the rooms, it might be useful to know in which room is a computer. For example, think about a university. It might be a good idea to know, oh, this computer is in this room. We can infer a few information from a room number. For example, uh, when I was a student, and I was in room B21 at uh, computer science, uh, where I did my computer science, uh, it would say that I was in the building B on the second floor, in the first room of that second floor of that building. And we can encode all this so that Factor reports us these facts. We can do this either uh, statically or dynamically. Let's do this statically first. It's very simple. You just have to drop a YAML file or JSON file, a few formats are supported, into a factor facts.d directory and just have key value assignments. So, for example, this computer I should have put into his room.yml file uh, this YAML snippet. And then I have four new facts that are available, uh, which are sent to the Puppet Master that the Puppet Master can use within the manifests to create the catalog of my nodes. So to be clear, you're talking about putting that on the agent side, not on the puppet master. Yeah, it's on the agent side, and it's the main drawback of this configuration. That is, I have to set this on each node. And I can't really do this with puppets because it's all about different facts in all different nodes. So I must have this as part of my uh, provisioning system, for example. But, well, as you imagine, it does not really scale. And if you have a mean to dynamically get this information, it might be better. In fact, I have written this uh, here. Maybe the hosts are named after the rooms they are in. And in this case, it's trivial to use the host name and guess which room uh, the node is in. Or maybe each room has a different subnet. So just by looking at the IP address of the node, I can determine in what room it is in. And it's what we will see just right now. So a way to create dynamic facts is to write this in Ruby. So it's a bit verbose, so I only provided two facts here, the room fact and the building fact. But the idea is that you can use facts to build other facts. So for example, factor that value hostname will return my hostname, and I just do some regex matching on it to get the room number if my host name was something like, oops, sorry, B21-02. And then I can use the new room fact to create a building fact, and so on. Or I can just create facts that run a region random number, return three, for example, which is not random. A last way to, oh, one thing that I didn't tell. Uh, this has to be deployed on each node because it's the puppet agent that reports facts. And 
it's not the puppet master that will use the host name sent by the agent to compute which room it is in. No, it's the agent itself that will use its host name to determine its room number and send it to the puppet master. So we need a way to distribute this Ruby code to the puppet agent. And in fact, modules allow you to share code between the puppet master and the puppet agent. So if you have a module, you just have to put a libfactor.facts.rb file, and it will be used by factor to gather additional facts. And then you may be wondering, oh, but you told us that your modules are supposed to be generic. And the room numbers I use in my organization are probably not that generic. And you are completely true. But I have not told you yet that the role and the profile are two modules which are specific to your organization. So in fact, the most efficient way to distribute uh, custom facts is by simply dropping them into the site slash profile slash lib slash factor directory. And that way, you have all your site-specific facts which are in your control repo. A last way to add custom facts into a puppet is by using a new mechanism that allows you to use any scripting language or any program. I guess that if you drop an X file on Windows, it will work. Um, and just output key value, raw key value. So here's a very short snippet of code uh, in, of shell script to gather the facts that we talked about before. Now that we have talked about these facts, we will talk about another great piece of Puppet, which is, in fact, my favorite one. It's a PuppetDB. As the name suggests, PuppetDB is a database. It uses PostgreSQL for uh, the storage, and it will store the facts, catalogs, and reports. That is, everything that goes from the agent to the master or from the master to the agent. Because it stores them as a DB, it can also query, you can also query the data. So you may want to know, for example, which nodes have more than five gigabytes of RAM and are configuring Apache and so on and so on. But the neat feature of PuppetDB is that it allows you to export resources and to collect them. What is an exported resource? An exported resource is a resource that is not configured on the node. And in fact, when you collect an exported resource, you just get the resource of another node that another node has configured, and you apply it locally. This is very handy, for example, for backups. Imagine that you have a profile that configures a software that produces files that are important and you want to never uh, lose. This profile may configure, may, uh, will configure a directory where, uh, for example, uh, backups will be written to, and well, where files will be written to, and you want to save this directory. So when you drop a new node, you will use this profile so that it will create the directory where the precious content lives in, but you will also have to modify the configuration of the backup server to tell him, oh, there is this node, you, show, you should save the directory, this directory from this node, and add it to the configuration to save. That is, when you add one node, you add to modify the configuration of two nodes, the node you're adding and the backup server, which is not great because it's a manual operation. You may forget it, and you may save all deployments of this profile except one but because you forget it, and it's very bad. So instead of doing this, for example, if we consider using, using Bakula for the backups, we can export the client configuration in the application profile. That is, when I use the application profile, it will deploy the application, and it will deploy uh, the Bakula client tools, and it will export the configuration of Bakula, and it will export a job to save these precious files. And these go to the PuppetDB. And then, when my Bakula server updates its configuration, it checks PuppetDB and see, oh, there is this node I was not aware of. I le let's add it to my configuration, and it will update its configuration, and now it can communicate with uh, the new machine. And oh, there is this, this job I was not aware of, and it, it added to the job to run. And then you just have used the profile on, on another machine, 
and the Bakula server has automatically updated its configuration to save this new node as part of its duties without needing to explicitly do it. This can be used for many, many uh, circumstances. For example, uh, for your backups, uh, that was my example, but for SSH keys, uh, when you, you are your, your non-host uh, for DNS also, if you have DNS master and DNS slaves, each time you have a DNS slave, you can update the master configuration to allow zone transfers for the slave. This is very neat. And the last thing that you can do with Puppet is visualization. Here is Puppet dashboard. It shows you how things goes on your nodes. When you have done this, you might be interested into orchestration. So to be clear, Puppet does not do orchestration. It's just configuration management. Every uh, once in a while, uh, your node will say, oh, I wake up, Puppet, what is my expected configuration? And here it is, here is the catalog, and I will apply it, and I will send a report. Uh, orchestration is all about the opposite. You are saying, oh, there is a new vulnerability in OpenSSL. I want to update OpenSSL now on all nodes which are live. And they will do it immediately. It's all the point of orchestration. Puppet Labs has an orchestration solution that they ship with Puppet, which is called the Marionette Collective which is quite a pain in the ass to configure. Yeah, you need basically one week. Uh, you have a lot of options to choose from. Each choice has consequences on what you will be able to do and will also have consequences on the security of the whole system. It's really ugly. Moreover, I want to add that uh, Puppet Labs is dropping this. It will be removed in Puppet 6, if I recall correctly. The good news is that uh, Eric Pina, who created Marionette Collective, has created Coria, which is basically somewhat the same thing, but with all things learned by uh, the creation of Marionette Collective and all the mistakes avoided. And the idea is that it will provide a single uh, setup, a single configuration, no choice to make. It will be secure by default, it's easy to maintain, and it's production ready. Coria is not yet available in the FreeBSD ports tree, but uh, I have some work in progress available if you want to try it. Uh, it's not very easy to set up, but it's quite doable. I did it. And uh, you can request assistance on the Puppet community Slack, uh, the use Slack. Well, <laughs> the Coria channel is uh, quite active. Ari Pinar is very, very active. Each time I had a problem, like half an hour after it was fixed. So, if you want to jump in, well, I just say try. It's not that complicated. Um, I've, I've created a wiki page on the FreeBSD wiki for getting started. So basically, all I say here is somewhat differently written, but well, it's a work in progress, but uh, contributions are welcome if you want to contribute uh, to this wiki page. Um, there is a puppet uh, group of people which uh, I am part of, that was created uh, last year when Puppet 5 was about to uh, be released. And I realized that there was uh, like six or seven different persons maintaining different parts of Puppet, and it was quite difficult to synchronize people. So we created a Puppet alias. Uh, but <clears throat> your feedback is important to us. So if you are using Puppet and you have uh, problems or it works well, please tell us. Uh, if you need assistance, there is a FreeBSD channel on the Puppet community Slack, which is not so good, but maybe the Puppet uh, alias will be replaced at some point with a Puppet mailing list. So if you want a mailing list to be created, just write a mail to Puppet so that we can uh, add it. And of course... Sorry? Uh, yeah, so there's a Puppet user group, which is uh, very active, yeah. I don't know if there is many uh, contribution or, of FreeBSD people there. I have to admit that I have not registered there. I did it for Slack for I don't know which reason, but not for Google. Uh, as usual, of course, problem reports are welcome. And I wanted also to say a few words with contributing with upstreams. Um, most of the projects of Puppet Labs are available on GitHub. 
And uh, well, you will have to sign a contributor uh, license agreement uh, for sending patches. And you also need a Jira account, which is another thing that is boring. But a very neat thing is that pull requests get merged. So sometimes they get merged, and only six months after that, there is a release, and your code is available. But uh, in my experience, it's, it's one of my smoothest experience with a large company uh, for accepting contributions. So it's really, really cool. And as a side note, if you have something that's broken with FreeBSD and you have a patch to fix it, and you have a merge request that it merged, feel free to send a mail to puppet at freebsd.org, and we might have uh, an extra patch uh, in the puppet port so that uh, the fix is available before there is a release. We do this quite often, in fact. Each time we have uh, some problem, we fix it, and uh, we we, we fix it for Puppet, and uh, as soon as the merge request, the pull request has been merged, we ship it in FreeBSD2. That's over for me. I hope that uh, those who have never used Puppet and are willing to try it will have uh, gathered in interesting information. Uh, if you have questions regarding the war, I might ask it. I will be around all the day, of course, so no problem for catching me uh, in the corridors for a, a chat. Thank you very much.